Normally we would be dismissing the children at this time, uh, and instead uh, today uh, we've got uh, some Bible story coloring books for the kids to color a couple pictures in. Uh, the truth is, uh, we have been reduced to two children's church workers. Uh, and so uh, we're going to have some gap weeks um, uh, <clears throat> as uh, the two uh, take turns. Uh, so um, <clears throat> we are looking uh, for people who might be interested in taking uh, some children's church turns. Um, you know, we want uh, some folks who are serving the Lord and want to serve the Lord by pouring some love into our kids. Uh, so if, uh, if that's you, uh, you can talk to me or Chelsea about it, and uh, uh, we'll move forward. I want to begin by asking you, uh, what's your favorite song? Anyone? One twenty-one. Twenty-seven. How about twenty-third? <coughs> Anybody? The twenty-third song's your favorite? So, all right. Mine. is the 51st. Uh, that has been my favorite song for a long time. Um, <clears throat> uh, anybody uh, would answer the 139th? I thought after we just sang about it that somebody might say, oh yeah, that's my favorite. Uh, but I thought, you know, if we didn't just sing it, probably nobody would say that one. Um, <clears throat> I want to... Uh, share with you that uh, as I began to uh, prepare uh, the message today and, and do a little bit of research, I, I was kind of surprised myself at just uh, how popular the 139th Psalm is. I was, of course, familiar with what is said there, but I hadn't really uh, uh, known that it was as popular as it is. So I want to share with you uh, some testimonials that uh, W.T. Kirkheiser kind of put together as he was talking about this passage. Now, by the way, W.T. Kirkheiser uh, is a Nazarene legend uh, in the Church of the Nazarene for decades. If you went to one of our Nazarene colleges, uh, amongst the uh, general education requirements, there was a, uh, a requirement on, uh, on the Bible and a requirement on doctrine. Um, and the textbook for years and years and years uh, I think it was titled Exploring Our Christian Faith. Uh, if that's not the title, it's close to that. And W.T. Perkheiser was the author. Uh, so, it, so he was one of the Nazarene scholars that wrote a lot of stuff, that trained a lot of uh, Nazarene pastors for, for decades, besides all of the students who had to take it as a general ed requirement. Um, but uh, he wrote uh, uh, a commentary about the Psalms. And as he talked about this psalm, he kind of quoted some of these. Uh, the crown of all the Psalms, and these are all from different people who said these about the Psalms. One of the finest poems in the Psalter. This Psalm stands out as the greatest gem in the Psalter. This poem is not only one of the chief glories of the Psalter, but in its religious insight and devotional warmth, it is conspicuous among the greatest passages in the Old Testament. Uh, so this particular guy went so far as to, as to basically say that not only is it one of the best Psalms, it's one of the best Old Testament passages there are. Um, and, uh, and keep in mind that combination of uh, you know, the, the religious insight as well as the devotional warmth. It's one of those passages that kind of crosses those lines. Uh, another Old Testament scholar uh, Derek Kidner, he said this, um, any small thoughts that we may have of God are magnificently transcended by this song. Yet for all its height and depth, it remains intensely personal from first to last. And so he's kind of elaborating on the idea that while it teaches this great and glorious and magnificent stuff about God, it's also personal. It's also very uh, intimate. 
Uh, and so we're going to see that. Uh, so we're going to look at not all but most of the psalm today. Um, I want to begin by talking about uh, what they refer to as its place in life. And Bible scholars have a Latin phrase for that, uh, which they say for every passage we need to know it so that we can kind of understand what the passage is, is about and coming from. Um, so it is believed by a lot of the scholars, not 100%, but uh, the consensus is that probably uh, this was written as kind of a prayer uh, in response to false accusations. So, so David has been accused of some things, perhaps idolatry. Uh, and, and so as he's confronting um, his accusers and as he's talking to God about his accusers, uh, this psalm uh, kind of comes out and of course he turns it into a poem because he was a poet and, uh, and gives us the psalm. I want to begin uh, by reading the first six verses together. So if you have your Bibles, uh, our church provided worship Bibles anyway, page 505. 139th Psalm, we're going to start with verses 1 to 6. Psalm 139, 1 to 6. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to obtain. And so this passage is one of the Bible passages, not the only one, of course, but one of those ones that teaches us this thing that, that we say about God, that God is omniscient. Uh, that basically uh, has the meaning, it's from the Latin. Uh, <clears throat> it talks about uh, God being the all-seeing. And that is all-seeing is all-knowing. Um, and by the way, omni is the Latin prefix for all. Very simple. Um, uh, so you can probably recognize the, the other half of the word is related to the word from which we get science. It's that idea of knowledge and knowing things and, and being aware of things. Um, in fact, uh, the dictionary says that omniscient means having universal knowledge, understanding, and insight. It's pretty all-encompassing. And, uh, and the idea is, is that, that this passage, in a poetic way, you know, David the poet, uh, talks about that being true of God. When I sit, and when I rise, when I get up, and when I come home, you know, it just when I, when, before I even say something, you know what I'm going to say, because, you know, you know my thoughts. Uh, and you think it before you say it. At least that's what we're supposed to do, right? Think before you speak. Uh, sometimes we get ahead of ourselves. Um, but, uh, but, but using this poetry, uh, he's teaching us that God knows everything, that he's omniscient. Um, and so um, uh, when we talked earlier uh, about guys like Derek Kidner saying that um, if we have small thoughts of God, this magnificently transcends that. Uh, this is one of those things he's talking about. This teaches us about God's knowledge, uh, about him knowing everything. Well, I want to go on and read the, the next six verses. Uh, so we're going to go on and read verses 7 through 12. Psalm 139, 7 through 12. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light will become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. And so in this passage, uh, unlike the, uh, the all-knowledge, this teaches us that God is omnipresent. Uh, he talks about going here and there, and if I go to the dark, if I go... It doesn't matter where you go. God's Spirit is there, too. Uh, so is God being omnipresent? He is the all-present. So he is the all-seeing, knowing. He is the all-present. 
Um, and that's present everywhere simultaneously. Uh, any of you ever watch uh, The Flash or Speedy Gonzales? Uh, you know, they, those, they can move really, really fast. And so they can be uh, over here doing this, and just like that, they can be over there doing something else. Uh, but that's not the case with God. It's not that he's moving around really fast. Uh, it's that he's in both places at the same time. Um, and so, uh, so that, that idea about being everywhere simultaneously is what it means when we say that God is omnipresent uh, or, or, or all present. And so those are a couple of those big Latin words that we almost never use uh, outside of, of sermons and Bible studies. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, it's good for us to know those. Um, omniscient and omnipresent. Uh, but I do want to clarify something. Uh, just because it applies to other things that we run across from time to time. And that is that when we talk about uh, omniscience and omnipresence, uh, those are what we consider to be attributes of God, not the essence of God. Uh, so think in terms of it being something that God has, not what God is. Uh, so God is not defined by omniscience and omnipresence. Those are just attributes that he happens to have, uh, but it's not his essence. And the reason that is important uh, is because, for example, if you read Philippians chapter 2, it talks about Jesus, um, uh, it, it says that Jesus made himself nothing. Um, the, the more uh, uh, literal translation is that Jesus emptied himself, and it's basically talking about the godly attributes uh, so Jesus, when he became incarnate, when he became a human being, uh, he kept the essence of God. He was still God. We talk about him being fully God. But he gave up some of those attributes that God had. Jesus, as a two-year-old, was not omniscient. Uh, and Jesus was not omnipresent. When he's in one city and people wanted him, he had to walk to the other city. Uh, you know, he couldn't be everywhere at the same time. Those were uh, attributes that he gave up. Now think about that for a minute. Suppose you had the ability to just know everything. And you had the ability to be everywhere at one time. You didn't have to worry about traveling from place to place. And God said, I want you to give that up. I've got to, you know, would you do that? That'd be a pretty big sacrifice to make. But it's a sacrifice that Jesus made. Uh, and so while he didn't have those particular attributes, remember, it didn't affect his essence. Uh, who he was was still God. So, uh, so that's our little clarification, kind of on a side note. Uh, but let's get back to the 139th Psalm. See, in that passage, when you read those, it almost sounds like David was kind of thinking out loud or brainstorming a plan to escape from God's sight and presence. It's like, you know, it's like, where can I go? <laughs> you know, uh, what if I do this? What if I do, you know, it's like he's trying to figure out how to get away from God. Uh, <clears throat> like Adam and Eve. In the story that Robin read this morning, uh, Adam and Eve sinned, and the first thing they wanted to do was hide from God and cover themselves up and get out of the way so that when God came to see them, where are you guys? Uh, they were trying to hide from God. And, like Jonah, that she also read, God had called him on a mission. He didn't want to do it. So he tried to run away from God. He thought that, you know, God's talking to me here. If I get on this boat and sail uh, that way, uh, I can get away from God. Uh, and by the way, I saw a good, uh, you know, we know the story. I hope you know the story. Uh, Jonah, uh, because he's fleeing on this boat, a big storm comes up and almost, you know, crashes the boat and almost sinks the boat. So they end up having to throw Jonah overboard. Uh, I saw a, a little meme this week that said, um, <clears throat> whoever's supposed to go to Nineveh, get there already. <laughs> Referring to 2020 and COVID and all that. Uh, <clears throat> all because somebody's not like, that's what happened to Jonah. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, so, so when you read these Psalms, the first 12 verses, uh, it can almost sound like that's what's going on. But the truth is, that's probably not what's going on. Uh, uh, <clears throat> rather, um, 
You know, this was not a, a big brother complaint. Uh, I saw another TV show or movie in the last couple of weeks um, where somebody was, was filming something and was being told, you can't film stuff here. And the guy's like, yes, I can. I'm in public. Uh, in fact, if you're in public, look, there's, there's a camera over there, and there's a camera on the ceiling over there. It's like, you know, we're being filmed everywhere when you're in public. In public, you have no right to, to, to a, an assumption of privacy, and you can be filmed. Uh, and we Americans tend to say, ooh, <laughs> we don't like that. Uh, we like our privacy, and we don't like, you know, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and the idea, back from George Orwell, the idea that Big Brother is always watching, uh, we kind of rebel against that, and we don't like the idea that Big Brother's always watching. But that's not what David was doing here. Uh, he was not complaining that God could see him all the time. He was not complaining that he was trying to hide and couldn't get away with it. Uh, this wasn't a, a Big Brother complaint. Rather, in the context, this was poetic wonder and praise. He was talking about the fact that you can't get away from God that you can't hide things from God in a praise context. Think about how awesome God is, because unlike the so-called big brother that everyone seems to be afraid of, um, <clears throat> God is love. Not just an attribute of God, but his essence. Uh, God is love. Uh, and so unlike any other force that could potentially uh, you can't get away from, you don't have to worry about not getting away from God. Uh, you don't have to worry about not being able to hide things from God because he loves you. Uh, and so I think that's kind of what David's doing. He's, he's basking in the idea that God is with him all the time, that God can always see what's going on. And if it's true that he was being falsely accused of some things, uh, then he's basically calling upon, you know, God to be my witness. I'm not guilty, God, and you know it, you know, you... Uh, you know that I haven't been uh, idolatrous. Uh, and so that's probably the case. Um, now, these next verses, I'm not going to read them. Uh, but when you get home this week, read them. They're, they're good stuff. Um, that idea, you know, I, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Um, but I want to skip down to the wrap-up here because it kind of shows the point I'm, I'm making that David wasn't uh, wanting to get away from God. Verses 23 and 24, he, he wraps up this psalm and says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So, uh, <clears throat> in this particular passage, uh, as David has been talking about the fact that God is uh, omniscient and God is omnipresent uh, he embraced that he wasn't trying to hide from God or run away from God uh, he embraced it he, he valued God's searching presence and he sought it instead of saying oh I need to hide from God search me I want to return to, uh, to W.T. Kirkheiser uh, who said that uh, that this last couple of verses really gives us a three-part model prayer that would be great for all we God's people to pray. Uh, and uh, so I want to use his outline, although I've elaborated on it a little bit. Uh, the first part of the prayer was search me. So rather than trying to, to hide data from God, uh, he's telling God, search me, get the data. Uh, get the information, look at, look at what I'm doing, look at what I'm thinking, search. Uh, <clears throat> you know, are, are, we, are we that open to God? Do we want to invite God to search us? Uh, <clears throat> David did. Uh, and then he said, try me or test me. And, and that is, uh, analyze the data. Now that you've got the data, look through it and, and analyze it and figure things out. Uh, and get to know exactly what I'm doing. Uh, one, uh, one translator says that the words really ought to be ascertain my motives. <clears throat> ascertain my motives. So you don't want, you don't, not only do you want God to look at what you're doing, go ahead, look why I'm doing it. And that's another place where too many of us would have problems there. 
Because uh, sometimes we can make ourselves do the right thing, but not for the right reason. Uh, and so, uh, you know, he's inviting God to, to not only get the data, but to analyze the data. And he uses the term, see if there is any offensive way in me. And again, that language of the offensive way, uh, you know, we live in a time and place where people are always complaining about how people get offended so easily. You know, you say any little thing, oh, I'm offended. Well, that's not what he's talking about. When he's talking about any offensive way, he's really talking about anything that, would, that might grieve God or someone else or that would hurt someone. See if there is any hurtful thing in me. Um, <clears throat> now, by the way, uh, if you do what I suggested and go back and read the part of the psalm that we skipped, near the end of that, David begins talking about vengeance on his enemies. Uh, and some authors believe that having just said that, he realized he was moving into dangerous territory. And that's when he switched over to, oh, search me and make sure I don't have that. Uh, you know, make sure that I'm, you know, I want justice, not vengeance. There, you know, uh, and so that, that might be what was going on there. Uh, but asking God to search you and analyze what's going on, ascertaining your motives, and really see if there's anything offensive in you, anything that might be hurtful to God or to anybody else. And then he says, lead me, which is the purpose for the above too. The reason we want him to search us and analyze us and really get to the bottom of it is so that he can lead us um, so that, you know, he can guide us, he can be the, the director, uh, he can point out to us where it is we need to work, what we need to work on, what we need to do to remedy the situation, where we need to repent. Uh, we want God to reveal that to us, because quite honestly, uh, we won't always get it right. We've all seen the, the comedy uh, sitcom scenarios where the husband and wife, uh, the wife is being very cold to the husband, and he says, what did I do? And what does she always say in those sitcoms? You know what you did. And the husband's always saying they're clueless. I don't know what I did. Uh, and I think in reality, it can be that way sometimes. Sometimes we can do something and maybe not even recognize that we've done it. Maybe not even recognize that we did it. And we're asking God, find it and show me. Reveal it to me. Speak to me about it. You know, use my conscience. Uh, convict me of my shortcomings so that you can guide me into the way everlasting. That's how he ends the passage. Uh, so here he's talking about uh, the path to eternal life as opposed to the pack of the wicked who perish. Uh, all familiar with John 3.16. Uh, <clears throat> I may have eternal life, you know, so that I may not perish. Uh, the path of the wicked leads to destruction, leads to John 3.16 word perishing. Uh, and he's saying, I want to be on the path that's everlasting, the one that leads to eternal life, uh, the one that is there. So, so the 139th Psalm, uh, talks about God's omniscience, his omnipresence, uh, and knowing all of that. And uh, as God's people, that is something we ought to be embracing and seeking out rather than trying to run away. You know, Adam and Eve tried to hide in the garden. Jonah tried to get away, you know. Uh, and there have probably been times in your life that you can sit here as we're talking and say, oh, yeah, I remember when I was trying to hide from God. But it's time we get past that. And remember that because God is a God of love, and because his way leads to the way everlasting, uh, embrace it. Know that he's there and be glad that he's there. And ask him to reveal to you anything that's, that he needs to deal with you with, uh, rather than trusting yourself to do it. Self-reflection is good, but God reflection is better. Uh, let him be the, the mirror that you look into. Uh, so let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you, Lord. Uh, being, some, being a being who knows everything, sees everything, always with us, always present, and you still care about teeny tiny puny us. 
Uh, it's kind of mind-boggling. Uh, but we thank you for that. We praise you for that. We praise you for who you are. And we're just reminded today uh, of your majesty and just how great and awesome you really are. Uh, help us to keep sight of that. Uh, Lord, and help us to embrace that. Help us to be a people who, who craves your presence, not people who want to hide from your presence. And, uh, and Lord, help us to pray that prayer, that you would search us and test us, you know, analyze that data, Lord, and reveal it to us so that you truly would, Lord, guide us into the way everlasting. Uh, we thank you for it and praise you for it. In your name, amen. And then uh, before we go, I do have a couple of announcements to make. Um, if this is your first Sunday back since we stopped meeting for COVID, uh, I think Lucas for sure. Uh, if this is your first Sunday back, uh, Lisa too, uh, we have a little gift for you as a welcome back, as a welcome back present. So uh, Robin just disappeared to get it. So uh, don't, don't leave without getting your little gift. Uh, uh, also, uh, normally at this time, we would be having our ushers come receive the tithes and offerings, but uh, to help keep people from contaminating one another, our offering plates are at the back of the room. And if you haven't already, uh, you can drop your offering in those plates uh, as you depart today. <coughs> and uh, this time of our, I will, <laughs> yeah, I just, yeah, out of habit, I almost just invited the ushers to come. Uh, <coughs> May the Lord bless you. As you depart to serve him for another week, you are dismissed. <laughs>